us this evening as she's with her daughter who's due next month. Um, and so her daughter Laura needed her assistance tonight. So don't you know, if you're a mom, where are you going to be when your pregnant daughter needs your help? <clears throat> Today's been one of those days. Connie and I were here together praying. It's just been a challenging day, so I'm trusting that God has something in store for us this evening. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. In this section contains our two key verses for the study. Both our apologetics verse and our application verse. 2.16 apologetics, 2.21 application. So let's dig in. Have you ever spent time wondering about decisions you've made? Can one decision alter the course of your entire life? Of others' lives? Even history? Back in May, Jamo and I were driving up to Dallas, Georgia to pick up our new baby, George, a Staffordshire pit bull who found himself attached to this couple's home in Dallas. And to make a long story short, Brian, my son-in-law, if you know Brian, ran into her. She told him the story. Brian sent us pictures, and two days later, we're driving an hour and a half to pick up and rescue our puppy, George. Along this drive heading northwest of Atlanta, my husband began to reminisce about the time his dad was deciding where to move the family. They were living in the heart of Atlanta, and John Mark's dad, George, yes, our puppy bears my father-in-law's name, <laughs> as, as well as my new grandson's middle name, Theodore George, but the people were already calling him that, and he answered to it, so we stuck with it. So that's our defense. At any rate, George, my father-in-law, who was a simple Alabama country boy, he sought a more rural life for his family. And so he was trying to decide between Northwest and Southeast Atlanta, and he opted to move his family to rural Newton County. And as we're, as we're driving Northwest, um, John Mark was reminded that he could have grown up somewhere in that area. And he began to wonder what his life would have looked like if that would have been the case. He wondered if he would ever even join the Navy, which was what landed him in San Diego, California, where we met. So he spoke of how one little decision can alter the trajectory of our entire lives and can change your life even forever, even when that decision is made by others. So tonight we're going to see his grace that works as we continue following one decision made by the Apostle Paul. One decision to defend the truth of the gospel of grace in the early church. One decision to boldly go against the tide. One decision to confront even those who held respected opinions in the church. One decision to be a God pleaser rather than seeking the approval of man. For the sake of the integrity of the gospel message. One decision that would retain the standard and guard the treasure of the gospel of grace. The good news that saves, that justifies, that sanctifies all who believe and receive him and receive his truth by faith. One decision to live crucified with his Savior so that his Savior could live through him by faith. Paul's heart never changed. Throughout the years of serving Christ, as he wrote to Timothy in his latter years, his last letter, God's truth must be retained and guarded. Retain the standard of sound words, he wrote to Timothy, which you've heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. The last time we were together, we were dropped into Paul's story 14 years after his conversion. During those 14 years, he had explained that he had received the gospel message through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He had very little interaction with the other apostles, and he was still unknown by sight to the churches in the Judean territory. And during those 14 years, he was absolutely preaching the message of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And one way we know this is because this letter that he's now writing to this group of people, this is his first letter that uh, Bible scholars believe 
had come to faith through his ministry, as he wrote in chapter 4. You know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe. But you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Paul had spent time with the church in Galatia, who had received him and his message enthusiastically and genuinely. And we'll talk more about that bodily illness when we get into chapter 4. Paul recounts that after 14 years, he and his partners in ministry, Barnabas and Titus, had made their way to Jerusalem to humbly share the gospel. That was the beginning of chapter 2. And he was humbly going before the leadership to confirm his authority as an apostle and to confirm the message that he was preaching. And he went before the pillars of the church. And while these pillars added nothing to Paul's message, remember they also took nothing away. So the same gospel was preached to both the circumcised and to the Gentiles, and the leaders of the church of Jerusalem, James and Cephas and John, gave to Barnabas the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and Paul. And they endorsed his ministry by doing so. So this evening, we'll now be dropped into another decisive moment where we will continue to witness that it is his grace that works not only in Paul's history, but throughout the history of the church to preserve his gospel message. And Paul tells the story. But when Cephas, remember Cephas is Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now, unlike the Judaizers, who had sneaked in and they were sneakily going about opposing Paul as an imposter and challenging his ministry and authority, Paul confronted Peter to his face. Truth must never cower in the presence of lies. But Peter found himself trapped by a lie that was fueled by fear. And Paul wrote, for prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began, Peter, to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. And so it seems, impulsive Peter caved out of fear. Even after his divine revelation regarding Gentiles, remember the story of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. There was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion, and what was called, of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household, and gave many alms to the Jewish people, and prayed to God continually. So this Roman centurion Cornelius, although he was a Gentile, had come to believe in the one true God of the Jews. What a glorious picture of his grace that works to bring his truth to those who seek him. And the Holy Spirit sends this Gentile a vision with the promise that his prayers have both been heard and answered. In the chapter 10, 3 and 4, about the ninth hour of the day, Cornelius clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And then, through an angel of God, Cornelius was instructed to send for Simon Peter, who was staying in Joppa. So dispatch some men to Joppa, the angel told him, and send for Simon, who's also called Peter, who's also called Cephas. So what does this Gentile do? Just what the angel told him to do. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he had explained everything to them, he sends them to Joppa. Meanwhile, in Joppa, Peter's up on the roof praying when by divine providence, he becomes hungry. And he too has a vision. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures on the earth and birds of the air. 
a voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And what does Peter, the apostle, the born again believer, pillar of the church do? Argue with God. <laughs> but Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything unclean, unholy and unclean. And apparently, Peter needed convincing because God sends the message not once, not twice, but three times. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times. And immediately, the object was taken into the sky. The message God sent Peter was in preparation for Peter's call to go to the unclean Gentile, reminding Peter that it is his grace that works through faith in his son to declare the believer righteous and set him apart for God's glory. And when Peter arrives at the home of Cornelius, he confesses and confirms this to be the truth. Peter says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who's a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet, God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. Side note, he had already objected to the Lord. <laughs> but when the, the men from Cornelius came, he had gotten the message and he didn't object. But sometime later, as Paul attests to, in his letter to Galatians, Peter caved to fear yet again. It seems Peter was quick to profess his bravery, but even quicker to shrink in fear. Remember the rooster crow? But before we point our fingers at the impulsive, unstable, cowering Peter, perhaps it would behoove us to look inside. Can you think of times you've caved in fear? I sure can. What is important to note is that God is faithful, and it is his grace that works. And as he sent Peter to bring the truth of salvation by grace through faith, God sent Paul to bring the truth of sanctification by grace through faith. But when fear of man rules over faith, there will certainly be consequences, and these can be far-reaching. In Proverbs, it says, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. This world, word exalted does not mean lifted up to prominence. The Hebrew word actually means to be inaccessibly high, to be too high for capture. So then, what is the anecdote to fear? Truth. It is his grace that works through his truth to conquer fear. It is his truth that sets us inaccessibly high from the snare of the fear of man. But that snare can become like a national pandemic in its pervading influence. The consequence of Peter walking in fear was that hypocrisy became the prevailing force at work among the rest of the Jews. Even the son of encouragement was not immune. The rest of the Jews joined him, Peter, in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Such grace that God does not hide the flaws of his servants in his God-breathed word. They're warnings for us, reminders that we are not impervious to the jaws of fear and hypocrisy. From Peter we learn if it can happen to him and Barnabas, it can happen to us. And from Paul we learn that truth will rescue us from the fear of man as we depend on his grace that works to boldly guard and defend the truth. And I guess we could say it doesn't get much bolder than this. But when I saw, Paul wrote, that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like a Jew, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Paul addresses Peter in the presence of all because the hypocrisy had been practiced in the presence of all. 
It was necessary for the sake of the gospel to publicly nip this thing in the bud. Paul's question surely must have cut Peter to the quick, as he was most probably reminded of his vision that sent him to see Cornelius, reminded him of his fellowship that he had in the home of Cornelius, reminded him that God calls us to let go of the distinctions delineated by man, Reminded that he had once embraced the truth that when God declares someone clean, they are no longer to be considered unholy. Peter had been set free from the law, but now his actions were placing others in bondage. I can't help but wonder how I would respond if I were called on the carpet in front of my whole church for my hypocrisy. So that's another point in Peter's favor. Because he surely must have repented. He continued to be an influential leader who definitively rejected sanctification through the keeping of the law. Listen to what he wrote close to the end of his life, some 30 years after the resurrection of Christ. After you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish. No mention of you doing anything. God is the one who will perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish. And Peter's second letter that firmly warns against false teachers closes with the admonition to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever, to the day of eternity. Amen. So rather than belittling Peter, we should learn from him. Because the truth is, all of us have a very long way to go in our faith as we learn to walk in grace. As Paul continued in recounting the events that unfolded in Antioch, he was bearing witness to the gospel message he preached. The message that was not according to man. Remember how he wrote in the first chapter that he didn't receive this from man, he wasn't taught it by man, he received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul was spoon-fed the words of truth by Jesus Christ himself. And because he was so completely well-nourished, he was strengthened and ready for the assignment. And one decision, one decision quite possibly changed the trajectory of the Jews in Antioch and the Apostle Peter. Just one decision can change the trajectory of our lives as well. The Bible teaches the believer is a new creation in Christ, one born of God, who has miraculously exchanged our old heart with a new spiritual heart through faith. What once was true no longer is. What was never true before now becomes the identity of every believer in Christ. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Some of us, however, may not feel the newness of this exchange as much as those who have what we commonly refer to as a dramatic testimony, like Paul, or maybe like some people that you know personally. But here's the truth. Every one of us who has placed our faith in Christ for salvation has the most dramatic testimony possible. We were dead in our sin, and now we've been brought to life in Christ. We were each one a spiritual Lazarus, rotting in the grave, wrapped in grave cloths, when called forth out of the grave of death and sin to be adopted as a child of the giver of life, to live with him forever. How much more dramatic can that be? Can anyone be more dead than anyone else? <laughs> Don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you you don't have a testimony. If you've trusted Christ for salvation, you have been miraculously, dramatically brought out of death into life eternal. And much of Paul's writings to the Galatians focuses on his grace that works through the exchange life, an exchange that only God can perform. And this, in Paul's viewpoint, was a non-refundable exchange. 
for who would ever give up their liberty for bondage? And tonight, as we dig into the remainder of this chapter, Paul will direct us to his grace that works through the exchanged life. Exchanging our striving after the works of the law for resting in his grace that works. From striving to resting, from bondage to liberty, from works to grace, and the ultimate exchange. His life for ours. After Paul had rightly admonished Peter for putting a yoke on the Gentiles that he himself was unwilling to bear, Paul pronounces what may seem to our Western mentality as startling and condescending and maybe even a bit self-righteous. We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Hmm. But here's the truth. God had, in fact, called the Jews to be his. To be set apart from the Gentiles and to demonstrate life as followers of the one true God. The Jews were given the law, God's perfect standard of righteousness, even though an impossibility to maintain. And because they had his law, the Jews did have insight to the things that were detestable to holy God. But when we compare ourselves to others, perhaps to those who are lost in their sin, we might say, well, we're not as bad as they are. But Paul's getting ready to level the playing field as he lays the case for the absolute impossibility for all of mankind to ever do anything to save themselves. For the righteous standard of God is just plain impossible to achieve. Only through faith in the Lamb of God will any be justified, declared righteous, and partake of his grace that works to impart the exchange life declaring those who were once unclean as holy. It is our apologetic verse, the defense of salvation by grace alone through faith. 2.16, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Later, we'll, Paul will explain in this letter at length the reality of this statement, that by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But in a nutshell, our religious background, our family heritage, our church membership, all our good deeds will never justify us before holy God. Three times Paul emphasized the, these opposing teachings, the works of the law versus faith in Christ Jesus. He, the, he emphasizes the reality that we are justified by faith and not by the works of the law. And he stresses that the flesh will never be justified by the works of the law, driving home the truth that the Judaizers had worked so hard to ignore. Even though we are Jews, even though we have the law, even we have believed. Now, Paul is in no way belittling the law. As a matter of fact, in his letter to the Romans, he defends the merits of God's law. And he says, so then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. What Paul is saying is that while the law that reveals God's perfect standard is holy and righteous and good, it is incapable of justifying anyone before holy God. For that would require perfect adherence to every law, every command, every precept, every ordinance. The NIV Study Bible points out this. Paul is arguing, what Paul is arguing against is an illegitimate use of God's law to make observance of the law the grounds for acceptance with God. And Matthew Henry in his commentary says, the law of God is holy, just, and good, and we should make the proper use of it. But we cannot derive from the law pardon, righteousness, or strength. As no mercy comes from God to sinners but through Jesus Christ, no man can come to the Father but by him. No man can know God 
except he is made known in the only begotten and beloved Son. So from this place in Paul's argument, he then addresses an, ob an objection raised by the critics of grace. The age-old problem for every believer, we still sin. And here he answers what appears to be the Judaizer's primary objective, objection to the gospel of grace. <clears throat> if God declares us righteous by grace, then won't that open the floodgates of sin? What would be the motivation to ever do right? And Paul's opponents may even have had Peter in mind. The nerve eating unclean food with the heathens. Because in their mind, that would be a defiant act of sinfulness. So could his grace be considered an invitation to turn back and turn away from his holy commands? At the bottom of this entire letter to the Galatians is one question. Is it God's grace that saves or not? And Paul writes, But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. Some versions translate minister as servant. The NIV says, does that mean Christ promotes sin? This is the same word that's also translated as deacon, one who serves or ministers. So Paul's rhetorical question would definitely give pause. Did Christ come to serve by promoting lawlessness, leading people into sin by turning away from the law? Can't you just hear Paul? How preposterous to even think such a thing. When we sin, <clears throat> whether we are the justified through faith in Christ because we believe, or whether we're lost, we are the ones to blame. So then, Paul's argument in con confronting Peter, couldn't it essentially be translated as, since you went back to the law, then that must be, mean you believe you still need the law, which would mean you don't really believe that Christ alone saved you. And then Paul wrote, For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. And the case is laid. If I go back to the law, I'm rebuilding what I once destroyed. For if I believe I still need the law, then wasn't it a sin for me to turn to Christ and away from the law to begin with? And perhaps the more question, appropriate question might be, am I then a minister of sin? Am I the one promoting and leading myself to sin? Now we must never believe the lie that grace washes over sin. God's forgiveness does not condone sin. But if we turn to legalism, to our list of do's and don'ts, after receiving his grace through faith, we are the ones to blame. We prove ourselves to be the one who has transgressed, certainly not Christ. <clears throat> And in light of his entire argument of justification by faith, Paul turns again to our relationship with the law. When we sink into the mentality that we can please God and rebuild with our own works, we become what Martin Luther referred to as those who seek to earn the grace of God by our own efforts, trying to please God with sins. Because anything in our own effort does not measure the standard of God's perfect righteousness. So therefore, it misses the mark, which is the definition of sin, to miss the mark. It is the law that reveals our condition as incapable of attaining life through keeping the law. And as we come to grips with this fact, and embrace his grace through faith, he will enable us to surrender and die to our own efforts through the law into order to receive what only he can give through the exchange life. And it is then that we will truly live. For Paul wrote, for through the law, I died to the law. Through the law, I figured out I couldn't keep the law. Through the law, I understood the only way that I was going to live to God was to die to the law. But the law is not then abolished. It was perfectly fulfilled in Christ. 
Jesus has accomplished for us what is impossible for us to attain, our justification before God. And remember when Jesus said, do not think I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Boy, I wish we had three days to go into this. But I want you to think about every single law in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ has fulfilled it. He has accomplishment, accomplished it on our behalf. That is grace and that is good news. The law actually prepares us to die to the law. When we spend time in those first five books of the Old Testament explaining his moral law that calls us to selfless, unconditional obedience, and we contemplate those stringent, excessive requirements of worship in order to approach holy God, and then we consider the words of Christ who said, hey, you don't have to do it, you just think it, and it's sin. We then we understand it doesn't take long for us to figure out that we cannot keep the law and as we realize the other futility in our own attempts to keep the law then we can make that one decision that will change our lives forever it's called repentance now this word repentance i've always heard that it means to change directions which it does but the the greek word here literally means to change your mind, to change your thinking. Repentance results in changing our actions after our mind has been changed. What is required is a change of our thinking about trying to keep the law in order to receive the promise. When we repent, when we change our thinking and embrace the way Jesus thinks about salvation, and we place all our faith in his works and not our own, it is then and only then that we are enabled and empowered by his grace that works through the exchange life to die to sin and to live to God. But have you ever wrestled with that question? How do I die to sin? Paul did. When he wrote Romans chapter 7, this was after this, Galatians, he wrestled with it. But so what do we do? Do we haul ourselves up by the scruff of the neck and, and kill ourselves in our mind? No, because that's still our own efforts, right? Paul explains that dying to self happens as we change our thinking. Through the profound truth of our union with Christ on the cross. As we apply the truth of his grace that works through our union with him on the cross, he enables us to live in this life in this flesh tent that we're trapped in until he comes to take us home. And Paul wrote our application verse. I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. When we place our faith in Christ for our salvation, the Bible teaches us that we are united with Jesus Christ in his death so that now he indwells every believer through his Holy Spirit to live his resurrected life through us. The exchange life. His life, not ours. Now in Romans chapter 6, Paul spends 10 verses reiterating, and I strongly suggest you take some time to look at We don't have time tonight. Those first 10 verses of chapter 6, don't you know you've been baptized into his death? Don't you know you've been united with him? Don't you know you've been crucified with him? And he goes over that ten times. Just repeat, repeat, repeat. Okay, Paul, we got it. But then he says this in verse 11. Even so, even so what? Even so this is true, even so this is true, even so this is true, even so this is true. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. King James says it this way. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead. I love that word reckon. This word reckon in the Greek is a, an accounting term. Any accountants in here? This is what you do with your books. You reckon them. It means to reason, to account, to impute, to number, to keep records involving both debits and credits. This word reckon expresses coming to a bottom line, 
the final total of an account, of a balance sheet, or other financial documents. Now, in God's economy, on his balance sheet, in our debit column, we read guilty because there is no one righteous, not even one. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in, but in his letter to the Romans, Paul charges us to reckon and be solidly convinced of these facts of the gospel that are true. Because we live in a time where people want to do away with this. Oh, we're all good at heart. God would never send anyone to hell. Don't, we're, we were born kind of good. We just you know, lost our way. We need just a little help getting back. No, the Bible says there's no one righteous, not even one. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible says there's a payment for that. We earn from our sin. We're irreparably dead in our sin, Romans 3.10. And we are guilty, Romans 3.21. But we are also to reckon and be solidly convinced that Jesus Christ paid the debt that we owe, that we could never pay. And as we look at God's accounting ledger for those who trust Christ, we are also to count those facts as true. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And now our debit column is eradicated. And there in our credit column, we read righteousness. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And there is the caveat. The one who has graciously been credited with his righteousness does not work. Let that sink in. Hey, I'm talking to me before I'm talking to y'all, okay? Does not work. It is his grace that works through the exchange life. We only have to reckon it as reality in our day-to-day -day life. By faith, we are to read God's accounting ledger and reckon it to be true our reckoning does not make it true it already is true listen to what James R. McConkie in the way of victory says our reckoning it to be true only makes us begin to realize the fact in experience <coughs> Galatians 2 20 is Paul's bold declaration of reckon, reckoning and realizing God's grace that works through the exchange life in his day-to-day -day experience. This is what the Bible teaches. We are crucified with Christ. But why does it so often feel as though we're living this life as spiritual failures? Well, maybe to begin with, perhaps, because we don't really believe his word. And then when we don't believe it, we somehow have to make up for it. And as the saying goes, don't just sit there, do something. But God says, don't do something, rest. Believe, rest, and reckon his word of truth to be the truth in our own life. Remember, this is no new thought. Cease striving and know that I am God. And the only thing he asks us to do Stop working and come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you find yourself weary of trying to feel? Feelings lie. The facts of our faith do not. But don't we often feel overloaded and weighed down with trying to do, of trying to get it right? Therein lies the, tr the problem. We cannot do anything in and of ourselves. When by faith we reckon on all he is and all he has done, we enter into the perfect rest of our perfect position, united with him in his grace in Christ. We give up the labor of trying in our own strength to improve our condition. Our condition can't get any better. We're seated in the heavenlies with Jesus Christ. 
We are to place all our faith and trust in his finished work, to regard as true, to reckon ourselves as positionally in Christ, crucified with him and dead to our sins as he lives his life through us, reckoning him alone as our perfect strength and trusting his grace that works through the exchange life to strengthen us. And this is what I think exactly Paul meant when he said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. <clears throat> Throughout the remainder of this book, we will hear more of his grace that works through the exchange life in the new heart that God transplants into every born-again believer in order to manifest in us a faith that works. And perhaps, the most crushing argument for justification and sanctification by faith and faith alone that takes the wind out of every other argument claiming that we have to do something to be counted worthy is Paul's final statement at the close of chapter 2. I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law then Christ died needlessly. Think on that. Think on that for a moment. I do not nullify the grace of God by trying to do it myself. It's a tragic thought to even propose that Christ's death was needless. This word nullify in the Greek has the idea of setting it aside, rejecting it and pushing it away. To make it of no effect. In essence, when we turn to our own works, we set Jesus aside as if, as if to say, I got this. You can stay there. I'm going on without you. Now, we would never in our right mind do that. But think of the times that we do do. When we attempt to earn God's favor with our own merits, then we, in fact, nullify his grace. And we foolishly replace it with our own strength and might. It's ridiculous to even think about. It's sadly ridiculous. But the sad and ridiculous truth is we do it. And when we do, who gets the glory? May we ever remember it is his grace that works to bring him glory. That was our chapter 1, verse 5. Forevermore, amen, through accomplishing what was absolutely, unequivocally necessary for our salvation. And it does, in fact, beg the question. If we can do anything to make ourselves acceptable in God's sight, then why did Christ die? And as Paul is going to laboriously expound upon in the coming chapters, he will continue to prove his case for his grace that works to justify us through his gift of, sa of salvation and his continuing grace that works through the exchange life. In order to sanctify us, to mature us for his purpose and for his glory, it is his grace that works through his supernatural exchange, his life for ours. In closing, think of how one decision to believe God's word and reckon our co-crucifixion with Christ as truth. One decision to repent and change our thinking. To decidedly reject works that nullify his grace. One decision to believe we are crucified with Christ and the life that we now live in the flesh, we live by faith because he lives through us. Think how that one decision could change the course of our entire life and maybe even history. That's something to think about, right? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just bow before you amazed at how good you are faithful you are, even when we are not, and will not, cannot deny yourself, you are faithful. We thank you tonight for your grace, 
We thank you for the truth of your word, that you have not left us to our own vain imaginations, but you have given us all that we need for godliness. Lord, you've given us all that we need to live this life by faith in you. Father, I pray that the truths that were spoken tonight would be embedded, planted in our hearts to bear fruit, that we would live for your glory, that we would put away the things that are our own efforts. We, we would stop nullifying your grace in our lives, but we would be ever so dependent on your strength that works in us and through us by your grace. So Lord, have your way in our hearts and in our lives, we pray. Change us that we might live the exchange life by faith. I pray you bless our time in our small groups. In Jesus' name.